Hey guys, welcome to Musical Month. 45 years ago, in 1975, the Rocky Horror Picture Show debuted at the Rialto Theater in London and the UA Westwood in Los Angeles, and promptly failed to reach a significant audience. A planned New York City Halloween premiere was scrapped, and even a double bill with Brian De Palma's cult musical Phantom of the Paradise led to lackluster results. Rocky Horror, despite all the success that would follow, started out as a total dud. Of course, the Richard O'Brien penned musical was never destined for mass mainstream appeal. They didn't like me! They never liked me! Sure, it was entrenched in the glam rock sensibilities of the time, but it also starred a bunch of relative unknowns, including Tim Curry and Susan Sarandon, the former of whom originated the cross-dressing deviant Dr. Frankenfurter character, who was also bound to turn off casual viewers with his overt sexuality and bizarre makeup. I'm just a sweet transvestite from transsexual Transylvania. I mean, it was, you know, it's dope as hell makeup. Like, don't get me wrong. Like, don't, don't get all up in my comments or nothing. Like, I love that makeup, dog. But, you know, for, for like, for you and me, for like normal people, like, you know, like your, your parents, it's weird makeup. Unless your parents did Rocky Horror Shadowcast stuff, in which case, wasn't that weird for them. I don't know where I'm going with this. I didn't make him for you. The fact that Rocky Horror failed to immediately reach financial success was by no means a shock. Luckily, Fox executive Tim Deegan had noticed that midnight screenings of films like Reefer Madness and Pink Flamingos were making heaps of money across the country, and so he decided to try something special with this perceived failure. The first midnight screening of the Rocky Horror Picture Show occurred at the Waverly Theater in New York City in 1976 on April Fool's Day. It has since never been pulled from circulation by 20th Century Fox, or Disney for that matter, and is therefore the longest theatrical run of all time. Go fuck yourself, Gone with the Wind. Go fuck yourself. Real good. This is serious fantasizing. Being a huge financial and cultural success, of course, Rocky Horror demanded a sequel. Instead of trying to replicate the original, another lightning in a bottle scenario, Richard O'Brien took the ultimate chance, keep the protagonists, and turn it into, in his own words, his own Gulliver's Travels. Rather than create a direct sequel or prequel, he made an equal. I think we can do better than that. While Shock Treatment would follow the same two principal characters, feature earworm tunes, and tease audience sensibilities, it would be a whole new adventure. Instead of transsexual aliens engaged in a Frankenstein plot born of 50 sci-fi influences, Shock Treatment would take its influence from game shows and the newly burgeoning consumerism that began to take hold in the 70s. Brad and Janet wouldn't even make reference to their time in the company of Dr. Frankenfurter or his Adonis creation, instead partaking in a last-ditch effort to save their marriage by taking part in a game show within the confined studio that seemingly holds the entire population of Denton inside. There, they would become victim to the machinations of the evil Farley Flavors, a corporate tycoon with a plan to monopolize mental health and steal Janet away from Brad. To do so, he'd utilize the services of Cosmo and Nation McKinley, ostensibly doctors, but in reality mere character actors, and Bert Schnick, the duplicitous host of Marriage Maze. Soon, Janet would become awestruck by her own fame, while Brad would be committed to the studio's in-house psych ward. Well, let's just say we're planning on putting sanity back on the national menu. This would be the start of an all-new, tonally different adventure for Brad and Janet. The only problem, of course, is that fanboys or fangirls or fan whatevers don't really want a new adventure. They don't want something completely different. They want the same old magic. And if he was being honest at the time, that's kind of what Richard O'Brien wanted as well. Now, I, I should note that this is going to be serious spoiler town, so if you haven't watched Shock Treatment, or Rocky Horror for that matter, which I'm not even sure why you're watching this video, but whatever, uh, go watch it. Uh, you're not, I'm not going to delve too much into the plot, like, beat by beat. I, I am making this video for people who have already seen Shock Treatment. Maybe you saw it a long time ago and dismissed it. Maybe you love it. Whatever the case may be, uh, this is a video made for people who have already seen the film in question. So, you know, go go check that out. Unless you've already seen it, in which case, I mean, maybe go check it out. I don't know. 
do what you feel is, is right, man. It's, it's, it's your prerogative. See, Shock Treatment came out in 1981, but Richard O'Brien had written and pitched a separate script in 1979. Rocky Horror Shows His Heels was the sequel that almost was, and one that, considering Shock Treatment's reception, the fans wanted as well. O'Brien's planned film, for which he wrote an entire script and recorded a demo tape just for the executives over at Fox, would have followed many of the same characters. Brad and Janet were back, the former entrapped by his new gay lifestyle, and the latter pregnant either with Frank or Rocky's offspring. Many of the songs that would eventually wind up in shock treatment can be found in this original draft with very little differences. In fact, some of them carry renewed significance if you read the script synopsis per the film studio analysis. Bitchin' in the kitchen? Well, that's the big number where Brad decides to leave Janet and go experiment with his new uh, gay identity. Little Black Dress is Frankenfurter's number while getting ready for his big resurrection party, which when you consider Cosmo's portion makes so much sense. Looking for trade is especially fascinating since there are so many allusions to quote young blood. And as it turns out, it's because the song is all about finding the blood of virgin boys to feed to Frankenfurter so that he doesn't basically just like dissolve into a pile of goop. See, in this version, Rocky has saved Frank's body after miraculously surviving the finale of Rocky Horror Picture Show uh, and utilizing the help of Dr. Scott and Brad, resurrects the mad scientist. But there is a small problem, and that's that their formula doesn't quite work, and throughout the film, he is starting to deteriorate and needs blood to survive. Which, uh, you know, if you, if you know anything about me, that's a plot device that I am quite fond of. Yes, a uh, cheeseburger, extra mayo, no pickles for me, and a bowl of your best calf's blood for my lady. In shock treatment, the number is stretched pretty thin in trying to utilize that lyric, even if it is stylish as hell. And if you remember, in shock treatment, that line doesn't really make much sense. That You see these uh, images of young people kind of dressed up as older folks. Uh, one of the girls is wearing uh, the a version of the dress that Janet was wearing earlier at her parents' house but it really just seems to be there in order to make the line young blood make sense which sure look what i did to my id carries a very similar significance to its final version but was originally intended to be sung by denton residents including janet's mother and father when they had essentially been turned into transsexual zombies i know this movie sounds great right Perhaps the most random song reused in Shock Treatment is one of my favorites, Dual Duet. In that film, we get a short journey into the combined consciousness of Brad and his twin brother, Farley Flavors, and the two basically hash out their issues in a sing-song battle that may or may not be entirely within one's imagination. It's a bit confusing, and that's because it's carried over from the final confrontation between Frank and Riff Raff, when Riff once again kills Frank and absconds with his child. Obviously, some references to Brad and Farley's parents were from rewrites, but lines like you lost your baby when you lost your balls and the best thing you could ever do is die suddenly take on so much more meaning when Frank and Riff are the ones doing the singing. It should also be noted that in the script that would come after this, which we'll get into in a second, uh, that song actually took place over a pool and a lot of the finale was basically a fight over a pool, a bunch of characters wind up falling in, uh, it's a whole thing. So the song actually made plenty of sense in the next script as well, which was the uh, direct precursor to shock treatment. Uh, but in this case, it has a completely different meaning. What's most fascinating here is that while the setting and context are stripped from the final product, the songs in Rocky Horror Shows His Heels are almost entirely carried over in their entirety. So why did Rocky Horror Shows His Heels never come to be? Sadly, it all comes down to necessities. A decision had to be made. For one, director Jim Sharman had little interest in doing the same old thing, although based on studio analysis, that probably wouldn't have been the death knell for the film. Instead, what really killed the project was Tim Curry, who simply had no interest in returning to the character. It's a shame because the script is so bizarre that it would have probably been another cult hit, but no doubt would have still divided fans, especially considering certain new character motivations like Brad and Scotty fawning over Frank and Janet having to lie and say that her newborn baby has died. Yeah, she gets dark. At the same time, it's understandable that Curry, whose career was rapidly taking off, would want to move on, chalk it all up to what could have been. Uh, and it's worth noting that when he was approached to play Farley Flavors, he also declined, stating that he didn't think he could carry the American accent, which, uh, I, I, you know, sure, we'll, we'll, we'll just assume he's telling the truth there. 
As long as I'm bringing up the original script for O'Brien's proposed sequel, it's important to note that the next iteration is also chock full of similarities to the final product, with most changes made to contend with production issues. Dr. Scott, for example, was meant to have a role as the studio manager, but since they couldn't get Jonathan Adams to reprise his role, the part was rewritten. Instead of being wheelchair-bound, the newly christened Bert Schneck is blind, but retains his Eastern European accent and manipulative nature. This also shows that, like, already things were going way off the wall, because why is Dr. Scott such a villain in this? In Rocky Horror Shows His Heels, he helps Frankenfurter out quite a bit, like he is the one who brings Frankenfurter back, and then in the Brad and Janet show, he's basically the exact same character as Bert Schneck, which is this, like, lecherous, gross, villainous character working with the bad guy, which, you know, I guess we never really got a full understanding of that character in Rocky Horror Picture Show, and it is strongly implied that he may or may not be a Nazi, but I don't know, it's just one of those weird little details where I guess whatever translated in Rocky Horror Picture Show wasn't really what Richard O'Brien intended in his mind, no matter how awesome it is. Now, little character quirks make much more sense in this original script. For example, much more is made of Cosmo's distrust of Farley, and Janet's successful career better explains her rocky relationship with Brad. We also get a lot more Denton. Janet drives around, goes to her parents' house, Judge Wright visits Betty at her home and joins her at a lover's lane sort of location that gives them a better view of the town and what the judge refers to as Farley's Pleasure Dome, which is a pretty dated sort of like leisure center concept. Um, it's, <laughs> it's definitely good that it was changed to a, a TV station and like a reality show um, starting up because it, it, it <laughs> It's really, it's really dumb otherwise. Farley Flavors, meanwhile, has gained control of Dentonvale as its new landlord. See, in this instance, Dentonvale's not actually a show. It's, a, it's an actual, like, house. It's basically the same thing as the decrepit mansion in Rocky Horror Picture Show. Uh, in that way, this does tie in a little bit more to that film, even though, again, all the major players are basically gone, except for Brad and Janet, uh, and Ralph Hapshit, and Scotty. Yeah. 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 A lot more is made of the brief glimpse of a TV mimicking real life in Happy Home in the original script, where a soap opera plays out and mimics the scene, which is otherwise almost exactly as filmed, until the Thank God I'm a Man number starts and suddenly makes so much more sense as dozens of other middle-aged men mow near-identical lawns. Most of this was scrapped due to complications from the Screen Actors Guild strike, which, long story short, meant the production had to take place in the UK, where the decision was ultimately made to fit the entire film into a single studio. Now, this part of the whole shebang uh, might have been Richard O'Brien's, like, creative idea, it might have been Jim Sharman's idea, it could have been anyone's idea. Um, one story I keep seeing is that it was because they couldn't find any locations that looked like Denton, Texas, where they originally planned to film. Uh, that seems like the most likely kind of issue that they would have had, and maybe Richard O'Brien or someone said, you know what, fuck it, let's just set on a studio, we'll make it about TV, I watched the game show last night, uh, we'll do it this way. Uh, either way, it's uh, certainly an inspired move. The biggest missing element from the Brad and Janet show that's not present in Shock Treatment is, well, actual Shock Treatment. In the final product, of course, the Scotty analog Bert supposedly regains his vision while the cast performs the titular song, but in the Brad and Janet show, Scotty is there and Cosmo and Nation use him to show off their electroconvulsive treatment, allowing him to walk and dance. In both instances, they're charlatans and the handicapped individual is faking it all along. The twist regarding Farley's big plan also makes a little more sense here, although it's never given enough weight to feel like much more than a means to an end. Basically, he wants to create a nationwide chain of takeout therapy, a la his own very successful fast food chain. In the end, only Little Nell, Charles Gray, Richard O'Brien, Patricia Quinn, and Jeremy Newson returned for shock treatment, along with a handful of the Transylvanians who appear as audience members. Brad and Janet were recast with Jessica Harper and Cliff DeYoung, a move which was undoubtedly the nail in the coffin for the production. While Harper and DeYoung are big upgrades in my opinion, having Sarandon and Bostwick gone was second only to the absence of Tim Curry on the scale of massive blunders in the public eye. No matter what happened at this point, shock treatment was destined to be a failure. 
Of course, plenty of great films are failures. As I already brought up, Rocky Horror Picture Show did not succeed in its initial run. It was only when it was put on that midnight circuit that things actually took an uptick. And even then, it took, I think, five months for the whole, like, shadow cast thing to develop and for things to really, really take off. Taken as a film, as a piece of art, was shock treatment a failure? Or was it a success? I'd say it's a bit of both. I personally love shock treatment to the point where I honestly prefer watching it over Rocky. Although I can't deny that the OG is the superior film, if only that its brand of incoherence is, well, more coherent. So let's take a look at what makes shock treatment such a fascinating little failure. In Brad and Janet's first big moment of conflict, they fixate on home appliances and other products rather than take on the more complex issues at play. This song makes much more sense in the Brad and Janet show script where Brad is literally in their home kitchen cleaning up a broken glass in the midst of contemplating his domestic role in their relationship while Janet is off working at the TV station. I haven't read the lyrics to the Rocky Horror Show's his Heels version, but it seems like the second take is the most cohesive of the three. Either way, we reach the same conclusion. This is an unhappy marriage that, on a consistent basis, always winds up deteriorating into in the kitchen or crying in the bedroom all night. In a way, the song works better by taking on an additional meaning in the final version, what with the consumerism context, but in the interest of being representative of this negative philosophy, the scene feels much more random and misplaced. In the Brad and Janet script, this all leads to Brad being taken from his home to Denton Vale, here a decrepit mansion separate from the studio with a final shot of Janet driving off along with the ambulance carrying Brad, passing the famous sign reading Denton, Home of Happiness. Even in that script, this is not a subtle film. Shock Treatment is a reflection of Rocky Horror. We get literal audience callbacks, including the audience as a massive character trapped in the studio with everyone else, with eyes always on the characters throughout their travails. This audience seems to know more than us, cheering when Janet's mother says that Janet's father doesn't like Mexicans, as if they know this is an intro to the next song, a song the audience participates in directly. You shouldn't have said that. But why? Your father doesn't like Mexicans. Your father doesn't like Mexicans. Yeah! Of course, we know now that this was a product of adapting and an adaptation of a totally different script, so whether or not this audience participation link was intentional is hard to say. As a sequel to the Rocky Horror Picture Show, Shock Treatment is certainly an odd beast. Rocky Horror was quintessentially 70s, but dealt with iconography from the 40s and 50s, while Shock Treatment is 80s through and through. Consumerism, narcissism, and of course, the rising prevalence of competitive game shows. Where Rocky spoofs horror movies, Shock Treatment goes after television, quite a leap, especially considering that Rocky Horror shows his heels would have taken on movies like Rosemary's Baby. So as satires, these are different subjects, but the uniquely Richard O'Brien obsession with Americana and the style of the musical numbers hold the two together, along with a host of other similarities. The obvious, of course, is Brad and Janet, whose Gulliver-type role is a fun idea that's well implemented, if too divisive to work within the trappings of the fandom. Ralph and Betty Hapshat, the judge who may or may not be the criminologist, various little tidbits like this issue of Time Magazine, and this brief cameo by a Transylvanian jacket, the little winks and references are definitely there. Cosmo and Nation naturally have an incestuous relationship, much like Riff Raff and Magenta. Bert Schnick has a fake disability, much like Dr. Scott does in Rocky Horror, with both of them being Viennese, according to production notes. The inexplicable finales are also quite similar, if only because of how random they really are. Oh, and the bad guys are all aliens from another world. Oh, Brad has a twin brother bent on vague world domination. Such drama, such randomness. Heck, the villains even win, while the good guys run away in both films. Even the restrictive nature of the set isn't all that different. Shock treatment is once again simply more overt, straight up showing us we're looking at TV sets rather than hiding them with some castle facade. Even the supposed real offices, such as the research lab, look incredibly fake and needlessly monochromatic. Of course, that could also just be a reference to the lab's color scheme in Rocky Horror, such as the trouble with film analysis. Shock Treatment is predominantly a satire of game shows, a form of television that was very popular in the late 70s and into the 80s. Unfortunately, there's really not that much to dig into with game show TV beyond the vanity and fakery of it all, and as such, the satire quickly starts to fall apart, mostly because we just hadn't reached the apex of this type of television yet. We hadn't really seen the full negative effects. But then you consider what happened 
after shock treatment. True story. Seven strangers <laughs> picked to live in a loft and have their lives taped to find out what happens <laughs> what? when people stop being polite. Could you get the phone? And start getting real. The real world. With the advent of shows like Real World, Keeping Up with the Kardashians, and the legion of other reality TV shows, suddenly the film took on a whole new meaning and depth that put it so far ahead of its time. To the point where I think critics might have been far more lenient if it had come out 20 years later. They'd still probably be pissed about the lack of transsexual aliens, but eh, what you gonna do? There's also a lot of fakery to produce drama in shock treatment. Most of it is centered on keeping Janet emotionally and physically distant from Brad. This mostly comes down to the seductive power of celebrity, which in a single brilliantly acted scene transforms Janet from a strong but down-to-earth young woman to a fame-hungry zombie, ironically the opposite of Miss Mental Health, as she will later be known. Chances are that if Janet was just able to speak with Brad, things would be fine, but instead the McKinleys keep them away from each other and all but hand Janet opinions and emotions to lead her further from Brad and deeper into a consumerism-driven self-love, and potentially into the arms of the nefarious Farley Flavors. Of course, the McKinleys are just following a script, as seen when the camera shows Cosmo literally flipping through a file that tips us off to Janet's new black dress. This is another one of those tidbits that carries less TV-intensive meaning in the Brad and Janet show script, but here one could easily look a little too far into. Eventually, Janet gives into the allure of fame and allows the McKinleys to bestow upon her a newer, more turbulent personality, seemingly because that's what Farley Flavors would like from his supposed dream woman. Of course, we later learn that Janet doesn't really matter beyond being an object that Brad has, while Farley does not. Out. 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 As seen with her parents' reaction to her new dress, this new personality is anti-traditional values, although this isn't communicated particularly well. As soon as they start to realize that this bizarre reality show is villainous, Janet's parents are imprisoned with Brad in the big title song and dance number. But don't expect mercy from such an alliance. Suspicion of tradition, so you wait. You need a bit of shot treatment. Of course, we've seen how simple they are, and so the show snags them once again, presumably via the McKinley's psychiatric techniques, and under the thrall of consumerism and TV celebrity, they quickly abandon their conservative bent. Of course, when you consider that Cosmo and Nation are just actors, what's most fascinating about this scene is all of these people who just magically give in, give in on their own volition. It's not really Cosmo and Nation doing much of anything. Later on, many of the characters can be seen dancing with mirrors. All of them are, of course, self-obsessed, more interested in being on TV than upholding any traditional moral values. This was true of TV fame at the time, but has aged like a fine wine as reality TV and social media were born and evolved. And just to get one thing across real quick, when I say traditional moral values, this isn't saying that the film like is pro-conservative thought. In fact, I would say it's the opposite. It's more showing that when people watch these shows and invest in these celebrity caricatures, suddenly those morals that they claim to have tend to disappear pretty fast. It just shows how weak human morality can really be. Janet becomes so obsessed with fame that upon seeing a massive photo of Farley Flavors, she doesn't see the twin brother of her husband, just a big face that would look even better if it was hers. This preoccupation with fame turns Janet into, well, kind of a bitch. You know, I'm getting awfully sick of hearing about that emotional cripple. I've got a lot going for me, you know. I'm going places. I'm going to be someone. I'm going to win my way into the lives and hearts of the people, even if I have to kill to do it. She quickly becomes too self-involved, visibly startling the McKinleys when they realize this has gone further than they anticipated. Nonetheless, the plan has succeeded. Janet has been turned into a superficial icon literally overnight, belting out a brief reprise to tell everyone to look at her. In the end, of course, it's all bullshit. Just like the set our characters treat as a hospital or home, even the McKinleys are little more than, well, character actors. And Farley? He's a disgruntled relation who, despite his immense success, just wants what his brother has. Not that you have to read into anything to get that, since Betty and the judge just kind of tell us. And Brad. And he's resented you all these years. And Janet? She represents everything he was denied. Oh. Or is he? 
Even that is suspect, since he quickly throws Janet to the side as soon as his plan starts to fall apart, sidestepping Brad and Janet in favor of his big scheme to, um, I, I guess turn Denton into a giant sanitarium? In the end, Farley basically goes full Hitler, or maybe even Trump considering his reality TV-driven fame and proclivity for fast food, giving us the ultimate impression of O'Brien's feelings toward modern television. His 5Fs logo does not help matters. The way costumes are handed out to the rabid audience, who in a very direct parallel want nothing more than to be part of the show, suggests that either O'Brien didn't fully think through the illusions, or he might have just had a certain level of resentment towards his cult fan base. In fact, the whole film is far more aggressive and mean-spirited than Rocky, another factor that might have pushed the original audience's buttons a little too much. That all said, when I say that he might not have thought the illusions through fully, this was a bit of a rushed production. So, uh, you know, who knows what was intended, what was not. Maybe, again, like with Scotty being a bad guy, maybe uh, it just was lost in translation. I don't know. All of this can be a bit confusing, which isn't shocking when you consider the turbulent history of the screenwriting process. Even in the original form of Rocky Horror Shows His Heels, the plot feels more melodramatic and convoluted than Picture Show, and with so much carrying over, almost verbatim, while the entire plot is upturned and transformed into a completely different situation, say for Brad and Janet's marital issues, it only makes sense for the final product to feel borderline experimental and, well, confusing. Rocky Horror is an infinitely more subtle satire, compared with the very in-your-face satire here that seems to be doubling down in the absence of the overt sexuality of Rocky Horror. Rocky is also a more clearly plotted film, even if neither tends to make much sense on first viewing. However, I'm of the opinion that shock treatment has held up so well because of that starkly different approach. Sure, we don't get Frankenfurter, but we never would have either way. The show's his heel script, while intriguing, simply had no chance as soon as Tim Curry passed on reprising the role. The Brad and Janet show very well could have happened as originally written if it weren't for the actor's strike in 1979, but while I do appreciate that the songs would have made a bit more sense, I think the studio setting was a blessing in disguise. In addition to nailing the eventual prominence of reality TV, it also gets rid of the less timeless Leisure Center unveiling in The Brad and Janet Show, and better grapples with the idea of fakery to produce fame, the poisonous nature of celebrity, and the takeover of America by corporations, an element that would be all too relevant that very same decade. Of course, subversion in a franchise sequel is always a bit of a gamble. Just ask Ryan Johnson. Now, I could go on about all sorts of elements in shock treatment, from the subtle body language of Jessica Harper to the brilliant costume and production design, but this is already an aggressively long video, and I think that really says a lot about shock treatment, that I could probably make a video that's four hours long and not run out of content. And therein kind of lies the issue with dismissing a film like Shock Treatment as just some sequel that doesn't have any relation to its forebearer. Sure, it's not a true sequel, and it really wasn't supposed to be once that initial vision was scrapped and Tim Curry was no longer an option. But by just tossing this to the side, by making a joke of it, by just saying it's the sequel that wasn't, or whatever, you're really setting aside a piece of art that stands on its own. You're ignoring the qualities that it brings to the table that are independent of the film that came before, that has honestly become more and more relevant as time has gone on. So as has been attributed to various production members in the past, Shock Treatment is not a sequel to the Rocky Horror Picture Show, and it's not a prequel either. It is, in the end, an equal. Now it's time. Oh God, what more do you want? I made your video. I can't keep doing musical month. It's not, it's not possible. You can't, you can't review four musicals in a row. It's impossible, man. All right, all right, I'll, I'll say it, I'll say it. Okay, everything, I'll say everything. This month, I want to thank all my patrons. You did an amazing job. 
just being supportive and stuff, but most importantly, I wanna, I wanna, I wanna mention all that is man, or as he's better known to his beautiful family, who he loves dearly, I assume. Brian, Brian, you're, you're amazing. Thank you so much for sponsoring this month's musical review episodes of the show. Thank you so much for your generosity. <laughs> and of course, if anyone out there would like to donate to the Patreon, the link is in the description. You can also follow me on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and all the other social media sites that spy on you way more than Brian has ever spied on me. I promise. I swear to God. Just don't hurt me again. Until next time. And mostly I just say this to Brian and his beautiful family. Please stop the torture. I mean, go watch a movie. <laughs>